morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. And if you'd stand with us, we're going to sing together uh, this hymn that, or this song we've been working on, We Are Yours. <clears throat> Amen. Let's sing together hymn 464, How Firm a Foundation Ye Saints of the Lord, hymn 464.
and the firm foundation that he's given us, what can you say besides hallelujah? What a Savior. Hymn 289. Let's sing that together. Hymn 289. Hallelujah. this as a special and we wanted to share this with the whole congregation i think the words of this song are so powerful and many of you already know this song we wanted to share this with you and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you once again
and dismiss our kids for Children's Church at this time. And as we do that, go ahead and shake somebody's hand there and tell them you're glad to see them. Get around the room and greet somebody this morning. All right, well, you can be seated there, and uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> get into our study here today. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, we'll begin our study here this morning, and uh, I don't know if it was the little bit of chill in the air, or if you were just singing so good, but I got a little bit of, uh, got some goosebumps while we were singing this morning, I tell you, uh, God is good, isn't he, when you think about uh, on Christ the solid rock I stand. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? That when you come to Jesus, you're not going to find any firmer place. You're not going to find any stronger refuge uh, than Jesus Christ. And uh, I appreciate your singing this morning, the spirit in which that you sing uh, when we worship the Lord through song and praise the Lord for it. But let's get into our study here. John chapter 15, we're going to pick up in verse number 1. John chapter 15 and verse number 1. And we're going to continue here in this study on the vine and branches. Jesus says here, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Let's pray together and we'll ask God to help us as we study this passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you that when we come to your word, we're coming to the reliable, dependable word of God. God, we know that what we see here today is true, and Lord, it's trustworthy, and if it's trustworthy, it's important for our lives. And Lord, there's something in here today, in this passage, in these couple of verses, that someone here today needs to hear. Lord, you have a, a message for their heart today, and I pray that you would just use me as your messenger to communicate that. But Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to get involved. God, this is bigger than any one man. This is bigger than any institution, any message preparation. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to show up today. We need you to work in our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that, first of all, you'd work in my heart. God, speak to me about uh, this message uh, here today in this passage that Jesus gave to us and that John recorded uh, for us by the Holy Spirit and Lord, I pray that you would speak to other hearts as well. Lord, we want to abide. We want to be connected to you, and, and, and not just in word only, but Lord, uh, we want it to be evident that there's a connection between us and you, that there's a closeness between us and you. And Lord, we just want to glorify you. We want to honor you. So I pray that you would be lifted up today, that you would honor yourself through the message and through our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've talked about this now for several weeks, but just want to give you a quick recap of this idea of the vine and branches that we're going to be talking about this year. We're going to cover this, these three categories that Jesus talks about, these three categories of topics and ideas that Jesus discusses in John 15 when he talks about abide, abound, and spread abroad. And so we're going to cover that uh, in as much detail as we can. We can't cover every detail of it, of course. This is a, a thorough passage, and you could spend the rest of your life studying it and gleaning truth out of it, and, and some people have. But we're going to cover the, the points that help us understand this concept of abiding, abounding, and going abroad. And so we talked uh, in, in our first week of this, we talked about Jesus Christ being the great I Am the great I am. And then last week we talked about him being the true vine, that we are corrupt, we are not dependable, we are not trustworthy, but Jesus Christ is. Everywhere that we have failed, Jesus Christ has succeeded and will continue to succeed. Everywhere that we have messed up, uh, Jesus has, has passed the test. Everywhere where we have dishonored God the Father, where we have dishonored God's law, Jesus Christ has honored it and fulfilled it and completed it. 
And this week, I want us to look here in verse number two when he talks about this idea of branches that don't bear fruit and branches that do bear fruit. You know, it's sad to say, but in our churches today and in our world today, there are a lot of phonies. There are a lot of hypocrites, a lot of phonies, people that uh, carry the look, they talk the talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. I heard a story about a guy like this several years ago uh, in Long Beach, California. A guy went into a fried chicken place, and he bought a couple of chicken dinners for himself and his date uh, one afternoon. And the young woman at the counter who took his order inadvertently gave him all of the proceeds from the day, an entire bag full of money. And most of it was cash, so it was useful. And she gave him that instead of his bag of fried chicken. And so he walked out of the door with this brown bag full of money. After driving to their picnic site, this man and his date were sitting and they opened up what they thought would be these chicken dinners and instead, lo and behold, they saw hundreds of dollars, over $800 in cash uh, sitting in front of them. But this guy was unusual. He was different than a lot of people. Rather than keep it, he drove, they got back in the car, <clears throat> he drove back to the chicken place, and he handed it back to the manager and said, I believe that this is yours, this was given to us instead of the, or, the, the dinners uh, that we ordered. The manager was so impressed with him, he said, I want you to stay right here because I'm going to call the newspaper. You are an unusual kind of person, and we're going to get your face in the newspaper, we're going to get the newspaper down here to write an article about you. I am so impressed with the way that you handled this. And immediately, the, the, the hero of the story began to backpedal. And he said, wait a minute, no, 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 please don't do that. You see, the woman that I'm on a date with isn't my wife. She's actually somebody else's wife. So our world is full of phonies. If you were waiting for a happy end to that story, there is none. I'm sorry. That's the end of the joke. That's the punchline. Sorry. It's as good as it gets. But we deal with hypocritical natures in our world today. If you're looking for perfect people, you're never going to find one. Even when you come to the church house, you're not going to find perfect people here because the church isn't for perfect people. The church is for broken people messed up people, people that have failed time and time again. We're not perfect, but thank God we're forgiven through Jesus Christ. And that's what church is about. But we we look around us and we say, where's the realness? Where's the sincerity? Where's the dependability? You know, honestly, the biggest phonies that I have to deal with aren't the people out there. It's the guy who's looking back at me in the mirror every day. Because we're all inconsistent at times. We're all phonies sometimes. We all sometimes carry an image that doesn't necessarily match reality. We'd like to live up to it one day. We'd like to get there one day, but we're not there yet. So when we look at verse number two, Jesus is going to deal with this problem. He's going to explain to us how uh, he deals with this problem in his church and in his body specifically. There, we talked about two members of the story already, the vine and the branches, right? Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. But there's actually a three-way relation in this story of the vine. There's actually three parties involved. There's us as the branches. There's Jesus Christ as the true vine. And Jesus says at the end of verse number one that my Father, God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, he is the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. He's the farmer who keeps up with all of this. He's the one who's putting all of the energy and effort and he's investing everything necessary to make all of this work. He's the one essentially who's calling the shots with this whole thing. And so Jesus says here that my Father is a part of this relationship as well. He's involved in all of this. And so the Father, God the Father, enters the story. If Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, then God the Father is the one who keeps that vineyard. He is the one who planted that vineyard. He's the one who commanded Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself even, to come to this earth and to die on a cruel Roman cross. It was an agreement in the Godhead, that Jesus should come. And God the Father, as the head of the Godhead, commanded Jesus to come. And so we see Jesus here explaining this, that he is the vine dresser, he's the husbandman, he's the one who put all of this into place. We're following his plan. And if he is the one who planted the vineyard, then also he's the one who examines the vineyard. He's looking for health. 
He's looking for fruitfulness in us. There is a God in heaven seated upon his throne who looks upon each and every one of our lives. As the book of Proverbs says, his eyes are all over the earth, searching to and fro. He's looking all over this earth, over every life, looking for health and looking for fruitfulness in our lives. So what does the Bible teach us then uh, about uh, the, the pruning work of God? God's pruning work. What, is expl- what does it explain to us about the work that God is trying to do in each and every person uh, to help us be everything that we should be? Well, first of all, we need to understand this. Jesus talks about producing. Producing. Every person is born with the imprint of God's likeness on them. Every person is born with God's uh, hand, his thumbprint upon their life. Because every person, it says in Genesis, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, that when we were created, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 1, when we were created, that man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Now the corruption of sin has introduced problems. It has corrupted that image. It has marred that likeness. It has distorted the view of God. Uh, that should be evident within us. But make no mistake about it, God's imprint is still upon every person's life. You still carry God's likeness within you. And this teaches us something. It teaches us that God is a creative being. God is interested in making things. Look at the, 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 the snow that, f- that fell last night that lays upon the ground and the beauty of it. It's not real beautiful when you're trying to drive on it, but you know when you look out the window and you've got your cup of hot chocolate, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And then in just a few weeks, hopefully, uh, the snow will disappear, the heat will rise, and so will the grass, right? The grass will come back, it'll rejuvenate, and we'll have a whole new palette of colors to look at. And then summer will come. And everything will become lush and beautiful. The corn will grow. The beans will grow. It's going to be a beautiful season where we all have sinus headaches. And it's going to be great when when our allergies kick in in the summertime. And then fall comes. And all of the colors change once again. The lushness starts to trim back and pare back. But then it brings the beautiful colors of fall. All of the oranges and the reds. And even some of the browns aren't half bad up here in Missouri. Now, down south... You get two colors in the fall. You get green from the pine trees and you get brown from everything else. It just dies because it gets down to 30 degrees overnight and that's it. There is no fall in the south. Here you actually get to see some of the beauty of the colors. But you know what it shows us? It shows us that God is creative. God is creative. Every sunset and every sunrise that you and I get to see, we get to see the, the, the uh, brush of God painted across the skies with all the beautiful hues of color that he has created for us to enjoy. He is a creative person. He is a thinking, feeling, and he is a working being. He produces things. And you and I were created to reflect that creativeness within us, that productivity within ourselves as well. God put that likeness within us so that we could reflect that same thinking, that same feeling, that same doing uh, personality within all of us as well. God produces things, and we are to produce as well. God is looking for something in our lives. We are more than just a work of art to God. I think uh, in our culture today, we have this idea that we're just God's little work of art we his little sculpture that God just looks at and he fawns over about how beautiful we are. But there's more to it than that. God does look at us and he does smile when he sees the beauty of what he has created. But he's also looking to see not just a piece of art. He's looking to see a, a bunch of grapes. He's looking for a vine that's producing something. And he's looking for something that will be created out of us and produced through us. Life is not about drifting until eternity. We have this idea, I don't know where it comes from other than the sin nature, but we have this idea within us that we're just going to drift through life and we're just going to enjoy everything that there is until we die. And that's the purpose of life is just to smell the roses for all of these 70 years. And then whoever gets to smell the most roses, whoever gets to enjoy the most experiences, whoever gets to climb the mountains and all these things, then, then, then that person is the richest person in the world. Well, 
There may be some truth to that. I think as we go down the journey of life, we ought to stop and smell the roses that God has made for us. We ought to enjoy the life that God has given to us. Life was not meant to be a pain. It wasn't meant to be a problem. It was meant to be a pleasure in the Lord. But more than that, it was meant to be productive for God. It was meant to accomplish something for God. Life is about recognizing your potential and realizing that potential to become everything that God intended for you the day that he created you. And for every believer, we are to become everything that God saw in us the day that he saved us. We are to become the person that God saw when he saved our souls. Enjoy the journey along the way. Stop and smell the roses as you go, but get going. Do something, accomplish something for God. The purpose of our planting is to produce fruit for God. That's what Jesus is intimating here in verse number 2. And he says it explicitly later. He says here that every branch in me that beareth not fruit, what does he do? He takes it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Why? That it may bring forth more fruit. More fruit. He didn't create this vineyard so people could pass by and say, what a beautiful vineyard. Look at all those lush leaves. Look at all of the vegetation hanging off of those vines. Look at how big it is. Look at how spread out it is. No, he comes in and he purges it. He tears those leaves off. He cuts it down to size. Not so that it can be more beautiful, but so that it can be more productive. So that it can accomplish more than anybody ever thought possible out of that bush. You know what the amazing thing is about being a Christian about being a believer in Jesus Christ, is that you and I get to get in on God's plan. God has this plan for what he's doing in this world. He has this mission that he is on to win this world to himself, to bring many sons to glory, it says in Hebrews. And you and I get to be a part of that. I mean, we're talking about the mission that the king of heaven and earth is consumed with. This is what he thinks about all the time. How can I get more people into my family? How can I get more people into heaven? That's what he's thinking about. And you and I have been invited and really commanded to get in on it, to be involved in it. That is not an obligation. That is a privilege. That is an honor that God would think of us enough, that he would consider us worthy enough to get involved in something so big Something that touches the very heart of the Father himself. God is looking for fruitfulness from the the vineyard as a whole. But Jesus tells us here that he's not just looking at Midway Baptist Church to see what Midway's doing, although he's doing that. But he's looking into each and every one of our lives. He's looking and examining each and every branch to say, what is that one doing? How is that one accomplishing its purpose? How is that child of mine doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are they fulfilling the mission that I've given them? Not just the mission of the church, not just the mission of Midway, but how are you realizing your potential? How are you building on the foundation that God has given you in your life? So Jesus tells us here that we are to be producing, not just as a vineyard, so to speak, but as branches as individuals within this vine. And then he talks about pruning. Pruning, he says here in verse number 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away. And then in verse number 6, he says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. He talks here about fruitlessness, the result of fruitlessness. What happens when somebody is not uh, uh, accomplishing that mission, when somebody's not displaying that fruit, what does that mean? What he's saying here is that these are people, these are branches, that they're not producing fruit because they're not abiding in him. They're not connected to him. You know, you've heard this illustration before, I'm sure, but imagine if I took a, a, an orange branch off of an orange tree and took it over to an apple tree and I took a pneumatic uh, air gun, and I nailed that branch onto that apple tree. Is it now magically spliced and grafted into the apple tree? No. Is it connected? Yeah, but it's not really connected, is it? 
It's tied to it. It's attached to it. But there's no real connection there. It's there. It's in the presence of the apple tree. But it's not grafted in. It's not connected the way that it's supposed to be because you can do it that way, but there will be no life there. That apple tree can do nothing to provide sustenance to that branch because it's not connected. There's no real tie, there's no real link there uh, from a natural perspective. And so he's saying here that those who never abide in Christ prove that there is no connection with him at all. There is no connection with him at all. And so what happens? They're purged out of the branch. He says, if you are not producing in your life, it is the evidence that something is wrong with your connection. There's not a problem with you per se. There's a problem with your connection. You're not tied in. You're not connected to the vine because Jesus isn't unproductive. So then the question is, why are so many quote-unquote Christians unproductive? Why is there no spiritual energy? Why is there no vitality within them? Why is there no desire for the things of God, for the word of God, for the the people of God, for fellowship? We talked about this in 1 John on Wednesday night. If you want to go back and watch that on Facebook, you can get what we talked about there. The, The birthmarks of a believer are very clear in Scripture that there are things that should be evident within our lives when we're connected to Christ. So he says here that they're not producing fruit. Why are they not producing fruit? Because they're not connected like they're supposed to be. What happens when you're not connected? Do you get to stay in the branch? Do you get to enjoy all the benefits that all of the connected branches do? He says, no. We have to cut you out. And you'll be cast aside. And he says in verse number 6, he uses the picture of burning. You'll be cast aside and burned. I think you can kind of get the idea there of what he's talking about. He's saying that those that are pretenders to Christ, those that would like to convince everyone that they're okay, that they're religious enough, they're good enough, they've done all the right things. I mean, good grief, they've been baptized, they give to the church, they come to church, they, they, they do all the stuff, they know the talk. They know how to carry a conversation with other Christians. Good grief, they might even win a soul to Christ. But if there's no personal connection there, if there's no abiding there, there is no benefit there. Jesus says you'll be cast aside and you will be burned. It doesn't matter how much we look Christian. It doesn't matter how much like a vine or, or I'm sorry, look like a branch uh, we think we look. The eternal destination is hell for all those who don't know Christ. For all those who don't know him, they will be cast aside as a branch and withered and they will be burned. They simply dry up because there is no life in them. It's a sad thing. It's a sad state of affairs. But you know what? It's out there. And I'd be a fool to think that every person who comes to Midway Baptist Church has this taken care of has their sins forgiven, and is on their way to heaven. I'd be a fool to think that we don't have uh, an element of people within our church who, who want to do what's right, who want to live an honorable life, who want to live a moral life, but they've missed the most important part. They've got all of the T's crossed, and they've got all the I's dotted, but they've missed the most important part, and that's to be connected to Christ, to have Christ and only Christ as your hope of heaven, to have him as the only hope of having your sins forgiven. Go over to Matthew chapter 13. Jesus talks more explicitly about this a little bit later in the book. I'm sorry, a little bit uh, earlier in his ministry. Matthew 13, verse 24. Matthew 13, verse 24. Lest you think I'm just making this up. Lest you think that this is just me uh, running down a rabbit trail here today. I want to prove to you that this is the heartbeat of Jesus. This is something that consumed the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 24. The Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. 
What's a tear compared to wheat? A tear is a weed. It has no fruitfulness. It, it doesn't uh, have any real benefit to it, but it looks just like a, a stalk of wheat. They look nearly identical. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between the two, certainly in the day that Jesus is saying this. So he's saying here there's a rich man who's planting wheat in his field, and somebody who's got a vendetta against him goes out into the field and sows a bunch of tares out there, a bunch of weeds out in the field, so that the master, the, 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 the keeper of the vineyard, can't tell the difference between the two. They're so close to one another. They look so similar while they're growing. There's no way to tell that there's a difference Uh, between the two so what's he going to do verse 26 it says but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit then appeared the tares also so the servants of the household came and said unto him sir didst thou not sow good seed in thy field from whence then hath it tares here's the question that jesus is implying does the gospel make true converts or false converts the bible is the seed in Matthew 13, that's the word picture that he uses in the context there, that the word of God is the seed that's being planted in the hearts of men, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it powerful enough to make true converts, or does it make false converts? It's the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the most powerful force upon this earth that we have at our disposal, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make false converts. It doesn't grow tares. It's not diluted with falsehood. It's not diluted with untruth. It is the truth. It is good seed. And so the servants here, when they say, where did these tares come from? What they're asking here is, how good's the seed? How good's the seed? Well, the answer is, it's the perfect seed. It's the only seed we need. It's the only seed that I needed the day that I trusted Christ, and it's the only seed that you need in your life today. Verse 28, he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, no, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. So he says, While it's growing, leave it alone. Because I don't want to damage the wheat. I don't want to damage the good stuff that's being produced out there. I don't want to tear apart the good stuff. Leave it alone while it's growing. But then in verse number 30, he says, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So the disciples hear this story, and they're thinking, What does this mean? This sounds really important. This sounds like a really powerful story, but I don't get it. I don't understand it. You see, they were were hearing it for the first time. They were hearing it, and Jesus didn't stop to explain it as he told it to them either. He just told them the story, and so they're coming away from it going, Jesus, help help us understand what you're talking about here. Well, then in verse 36, we see that Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parables of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. It's Jesus Christ. He's saying that that represents me. Uh, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So he says here, here's the players in the story. Here's the characters in the story. The good wheat, that's the children of, this, the children of uh, my kingdom. That's believers. That's followers of Jesus Christ. People that have trusted in me for salvation, that have had their sins forgiven. Their names are written down in glory. Those are the good seed, the, the, the good wheat. The tares are those who never have done that. They're the ones who are still under bondage to sin, under bondage to Satan. They have not freed themselves from his chains. They are the children of the devil himself. He says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The sad part is, is that in the story, 
You can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. You can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. Only the wheat knows that it's wheat. Only the tares know that it's a tear. We do our best to help people know Christ as a church, as believers. We do our best to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ undiluted, without watering it down, without adding anything to it. We preach it as it is to men as we are in our need. But at the end of the day, when somebody makes a profession of faith, it's in God's hands, isn't it? Ultimately, I don't know and you don't know, only they know. Now, I know my disposition with God. I know where I stand with God, but you don't know where I stand with God. I know where I stand with God, but I don't know where you stand with God. This is, this is a, a big truth, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to preach this wrong. But I have no doubt about it, that within a congregation of our size, that we're not all wheat. That they may, may very well be some tares in our midst. And I'm not saying that to, to make you an enemy. I'm not saying that to make you the problem. I say that with hurt in my heart. I say that with hurt, that you may yourself have tricked yourself. You may have deceived yourself into thinking that I'm good enough. I've done enough. I've done these things over here. I look productive. But what is there spiritual life? Is there spiritual energy? Is there love for Christ? Is there love for God? Is there love for the things of God? Is there love for the word of God? Is there a desire to know him through his word? Is there a desire to bless other people and to bless other believers? Is the productivity there? Now look, I'm not here this morning to take everybody out of heaven and cast us all into hell. It's not the purpose. But this morning, we're going to take communion here in just a few moments. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that when we take, we better take worthily. Meaning that we better mean what we say through the elements. That we really are children of God. That we really are followers of Jesus Christ. Not so that we can feel terrible, not so that we can be demonized, but so that we can come to Christ if we're not there already. So here's the question this morning. Who is the true church? Who's in the true church? By the true church, I mean who's in the body of Christ? That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 13. That's what he's saying in John chapter 15 and verse number 2. He's saying we're looking for those who really are uh, members of the body of Christ, not just those who've made a profession, not just those who've prayed a prayer, but those who have truly trusted in Christ, those who have given their heart and their life to Christ, who have turned from their sins and given themselves to Jesus Christ. Salvation is a moment in time when a person places their full assurance and confidence in Christ, and in that moment, they are placed in Christ, and Christ comes to dwell with them by his Holy Spirit. Salvation is not a procession, it's not a journey, it's not progress, it is a single moment in time. If you don't believe that, ask the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross didn't have to work his way through the journey of faith. He looked at Jesus and he said, You are the Son of God. I know you have a kingdom coming. Just remember me that I stood next to you, that I stood by you, and I protected your honor and I protected your name. When you come into your kingdom, just remember who I am. And Jesus said, That's all I need. He said, I don't need you to do anything else. I don't need you to perform some work. I don't need you to... Pray a prayer even. He says, I just needed your faith. You've demonstrated your faith. That's all I need. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. If that's not enough, ask the Philippian jailer. When Paul and Silas were in that prison that night, and they were held captive, and the earthquake came, and their chains fell off, and the doors sprung open, and it was so dark and pitch black in that hole in the ground of a dungeon that the, the jailer, the warden, he could not see what was going on. He couldn't tell where anybody was. He thought, surely they've all escaped. They've all run away. And in that day, if you were a Roman jailer and you lost prisoners, your life was forfeit. You were to be executed. 
And so he thought, well, this is, this is the end for me. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be beaten to death. Who knows what they're going to do to me? He says, I'm just going to take my life right now. He pulls his sword from his sheath. He places it on his stomach, ready to fall upon his own sword. And Paul and Silas come jumping into the room and they say, Stop! Please don't do this. We're still here. All of us are here. No one has escaped. You're safe. And with relief written probably all over that man, probably in a cold sweat. I mean, can you imagine the, the, the lowness, the hopelessness that somebody has to go through to be ready to take their own life? The hurt that must be there. The pain that would drive them to an action like that. Well, people like that need help. They don't need to be pitied. They need help. They need somebody to be there. Somebody to hear their hurt. Somebody to carry their hurt. And that's what Paul and Silas did. They came in with the best balm, with the best salve that's ever been invented for the hurt of man. They came into the room, and that man fell upon his knees before me. He said, oh, thank goodness you're here. Oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. That's not in the text. But I'm sure he said something like that under his breath. Oh, thank goodness you're still here. I thought I was a dead man. And he looked at them and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Is there some work I have to do? Is there some baptism I have to be baptized with? Is there some money I have to give? Is there some temple I have to visit? Is there some thing I need to do for you to be saved? And what does Paul tell him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In that night, in the middle of that jail, on his knees, two minutes away from suicide, that jailer said, I believe. And in that moment, his soul was saved. His sins were forgiven. And he was, became a child of God forever. If it's good enough for the man on the cross, the thief on the cross, if it's good enough for the Philippian jailer, who am I to think that I have to add something to it? That I need something besides what they got? That there's some other process involved? That there's something else you got to do for it? Jesus tells us here, are you wheat or are you tear? John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. You know what he's saying there? He's saying you can look like a vine, you can look like wheat, but without me, there's going to be something missing. Without me, there's going to be something seriously wrong. There's going to be something out of place. And you might be the only one who knows it. You will experience it. You will come to grips with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Paul says this about salvation. He says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. When you, the moment you get saved, the moment a person trusts Christ, like that thief on the cross, like the Philippian jailer, something amazing happens. There's a miracle in a moment that takes place. And you may not see it, you may not even feel it, but it took place. We don't walk by, we don't walk by sight. We don't walk by evidence. We don't walk by feelings even. We walk by faith. We believe that these things take place because God said these things take place. And I think God's pretty trustworthy. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, by the way, can I just tell you this? I've had a lot of people tell me that um, they, don't, they don't like referring to um, salvation, especially when you're talking to children, as Christ coming into you. Christ coming into your heart. I've had a lot of people tell me that, that, that that's false theology. You shouldn't tell people that, that that's not accurate. I'm sorry, I still use that terminology a lot of times when I work with kids. Why? Because of Colossians 1.27, which says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I understand what they're trying to say. I think I know where they're trying to go with that. But don't you dare take Jesus away from me. Don't you dare take Jesus out of my salvation. 
Don't take Jesus out of my life. He's the best thing I've got going in my life. I live a pretty good life. I'm thankful for every gift that God has given to me. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my daughter. I'm thankful for this church that I get the opportunity to pastor. I'm thankful for all of it, the family, the friends that I have, but there's nothing I've got going for me better than what Jesus has done and is doing for me. We're going to jump ahead here. I had a whole lot more I wanted to talk about. We'll maybe pick that up next week and talk about the purging process and the purifying process. But I want you to go to John 13. John 13, verse number 4. John 13, verse number 4. The Bible says this about the Last Supper. And by the way, what we're reading here in John 15, this message that Jesus is preaching is taking place immediately after the Last Supper. So they're still sitting there filled with the food of that Passover meal in their stomachs while Jesus is telling them this. And John 13 tells us what took place before the Passover meal started. It gives us the runway that leads us into John 15. He says in John 13, verse number 4, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? You see, you've got to understand in this day and time, even normal servants didn't wash people's feet. Only the lowest servants washed people's feet. Certainly not the master of the house, certainly not the rabbis, the leaders, the teachers of that day. But Jesus, as the rabbi, the leader of this rabble of disciples, and as God himself, the master of their souls, he takes a towel, wraps it around his stomach, and then leans down in that basin of water, dips the towel in the water, and begins to wash Peter's feet. And Peter says, whoa, Lord, are you washing my feet? What are you doing? Dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. He's saying, Peter, I'm trying to teach you a lesson, and you'll understand here real soon. You'll understand what I mean by this lesson here very soon. Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. Lord, I'm not worthy of that. I wouldn't want you to touch my feet. Lord, you know where I've been. You know what I've done. You know where these feet have taken me. How could you, how could you touch my feet? How could you condescend so low to touch a sinner like me? Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. He's saying, My true disciples have been washed. My true disciples have been cleaned by me, not by some preacher, not by some program, not by a Sunday school teacher, but by me, by his spirit, by his touch. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You see, Peter got the lesson now. He, got, he understood. He said, I want to be a part of Jesus. So, so Lord, whatever it takes, you do it. If you've got to dump the whole bucket on my head, you go right ahead. And and. This is Peter's way of doing things. You know, he's, not, he's a nice guy, but he's, he's a lot like me. You know, he's just not the brightest bulb in the batch. You know? He just doesn't quite get things. He goes a little far sometimes. So Jesus has to calm him down. Verse number 10, he says, Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet. He says, Peter, don't worry about it. This is enough. It's just a word picture, okay? Calm down. He says, but if I wash your feet, you are clean every whit. Everywhere, everything that touches you has been cleaned. Cleaned every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. But not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. He says there's somebody here who isn't clean. There's somebody here who isn't there yet. The rest of the story is, is they're sitting at dinner and they're going through the Passover meal. And by the way, on March 11th, we're actually having somebody come in to demonstrate a Passover Seder, a Passover meal for us, so we can see 
what it was like that night when they went through the Last Supper and, and all of those things. And Jesus is sitting there and he's dipping the sop, getting ready for that part of the Passover Seder, the Passover meal. And as he's getting ready to dip it, uh, he starts talking about somebody who's going to betray him. And they said, Lord, who of us would betray you? We love you. None of us would do that to you. We've given the last three years of our lives to follow you. How in the world would anybody of us ever betray you? And he says, the person to whom I give the sop when I've dipped it, that's the traitor. He dips the sop and he hands it to Judas Iscariot. In Judas, immediately when he gets the sop, he gets up and he walks out. But none of the disciples get it. They still, they look at him and they say, oh, Judas must have forgotten something. He must, uh, he must need to go take care of some business. Because it doesn't even occur to them that it's even possible that Judas could be the traitor. He is so far removed from suspicion that it absolutely astonishes them. They can't even comprehend. It doesn't click with them that Judas is a fake. He's a phony. He's walked with them for three years. He was so trustworthy that they gave him all the money from the offerings. He was the treasurer. Mike, sorry to pick you out here today, buddy. Sorry to pick on the treasurers here today. He's the one who has all of that sewed up. He's the one who's got it all taken care of. He's the most trustworthy guy. He's the last guy on earth you would suspect. Doesn't really follow Jesus. He's followed him everywhere with his feet. But never once has he followed him with his heart. There's a difference, isn't there? We can't see it. We can't measure it. There's no x-ray machine that we can stand in front of and say, okay, you're good. You know, wouldn't that be easy if, if we could do that? But that's not the way life works. That's not the way the spirit of man works. And I would be a fool to stand here today and to assume that every person that passes through the door of Midway Baptist Church is a Peter and that there aren't a Judas or two in our midst. I remember years ago, I was in a preacher's meeting. I was just a teenager and I was fortunate enough to be invited to sit in on this preacher's meeting. And my home pastor, Jeff Amsbaugh, stood up and he was talking with the other preachers and he said, I got a call today that really shocked me. He said, I got a call today from a missionary candidate. The guy's out there trying to raise money. He's taken his family on the road for years to try to raise money to go be a missionary. And they're traveling all around America, burning up vehicles, burning up tires, eating McDonald's every day for the cause of Christ. He says, I know this guy. He's a trustworthy guy. I've seen him win souls to Christ with my own eyes. I've heard the testimonies of him being a soul winner. He called me today. And he said, Pastor Ansbaugh, I wanted you to know that I finally got saved. He said, it blew me away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this guy, of all people, had never really come to be a believer in Christ. That he was just playing the game. He was just trying to fit in. He wanted to be a believer, but he wasn't willing to take that step. He wasn't willing to put all of his faith and trust in Christ. Maybe he was trusting in his goodness. Maybe he was trusting in his mom and dad's faith, but it never made it personal. Who knows? Who knows how all of these things happen? None of us can predict those things. But he said, you know what? He said, we're going to have to reevaluate whether that guy needs to be on the mission field at this point. We've got some discussions we've got to have. I hope it works out for him. And he says, I don't know what his future holds, but he says, I know this. I'm glad he's born again. I'm glad he's saved. Can I tell you this? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're playing the part but have never really trusted Christ for yourself. That doesn't matter. If you trust Christ, nobody here is going to say, I'd have never believed it of you. Nobody's going to come to you and say, you're a phony, you're a fake, you're a fraud. No. (laughs) We're going to be excited. I'm going to be thrilled. Because there's a new name written down in glory. And all of heaven will rejoice over one sinner that repents. 
God is going to leap and shout and jump for joy for one soul that trusts him. And it may be your soul that needs to trust him today. Can I encourage you? Examine yourself. See whether you are in the faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Christianity and salvation is not about information. How much do I know? It's not about reformation. What good things am I doing? Am I a better man today than I was yesterday? At its core, Christianity, faith in Christ, is about transformation. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There needs to be a change. When Jesus moves into somebody's life, he ought to make a difference. Look, I don't want to assume the worst of any one individual here today. I didn't preach this message because I knew somebody was going to be here, and I said, that person needs to hear this. It's just where we are in John 15. It's God's divine appointment, not mine. I'm not preaching this because I think there's a problem or I know that this person needs to hear this, but I don't want to stand before God someday as the pastor of this church and confess that I assumed that everybody was born again. And I didn't do my due diligence, I didn't do my part in share the truth of Jesus Christ because I just assumed everybody was okay. I don't want to have to give account for that. And so can I tell you this, in our invitation time, if you're struggling with doubts about your salvation, come forward. I'm pleading with you this morning. Come forward and get that settled today. We can take care of it now. You don't have to wait another day. You don't have to put your head on your pillow one more night in terror, hoping that you wake up tomorrow. You don't have to spend one more night hoping that the rapture doesn't happen while you sleep. You don't have to spend one more evening scared to death that you're going to wake up and your spouse is going to be gone, but you're still going to be here. You don't have to spend one more waking moment afraid and doubting. We can get that settled here today. How sad to be like Judas, to hear the truth, understand the truth, but never receive the truth. If that's you, it's time to admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ, and receive Christ's gift of forgiveness. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone that is here today. I thank you for their patience. I thank you for their uh, tolerance this morning as we talk through a difficult passage of Scripture. Lord, their, uh, the, the, their patience is obvious. Lord, I pray that and trust that the patience and the attention was because maybe you were working. Or maybe there's somebody here today that needs to come and meet Jesus Christ. Not religion, not church attendance, not giving, not a good life, but to meet Jesus, to surrender all to him. Lord, as your spirit is quietly whispering to their heart, tugging on their heartstring, Lord, I pray that they'd respond. As your spirit is moving upon them, Lord, creating that unrest, that lack of peace, Lord, I trust that you're dealing with them. Lord, I pray that in this time of invitation, you would speak to their hearts and show them their need. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know that your sins are forgiven, you know that you're on your way to heaven, would you just slip your hand up there as a testimony of your salvation here today? I'm not going to embarrass anybody calling anybody down, but thank you so much for your honesty. You can put your hands down there. If you were unable to raise your hand, can I tell you this? God wants you to know. He's made it so clear and so simple. It's not necessarily easy, but it's simple. We'd love to explain it to you today. I'll be down front here in just a moment as the piano plays. And as, as the piano plays, if God has spoken to your heart, come forward, get my attention. Take me by the hand and say, I need to talk to somebody. Coming forward isn't an admission that you're lost. It's, it's an admission that you have some questions, that there's something off, and you just want somebody to talk to you, you want somebody to pray with you about it. If that's you this, this day, would you come forward? Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I know I got that taken care of. I know that I'm saved. And I can tell you why. But maybe God's dealing with you about some other area of your life. Maybe he's dealing with you like he's dealing with me about somebody that that needs Christ. That needs to be saved.
don't you pray for them today? Why don't you ask God to save them once again? Maybe you've prayed for them a hundred times, a thousand times. Pray for them again. Ask God to save their soul. Ask God to put somebody in their path to confront them with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ and pray that their hearts will be ready and prepared. As the piano plays this morning and as we prepare to observe communion, if God has spoken to your heart, I'd invite you to come. I'd invite you to do business, whether it's here at this altar or there in your seats. If there's some unconfessed sin in your heart, maybe some anger, some lust, some pride, something in your heart that needs to be dealt with before we take communion, before we break this bread and drink this cup together, would you prepare your heart? As the piano plays, if God has spoken to you, this is your time to respond. Would you come? our deacons to come forward and to help me uh, as we observe communion together. And as we get ready to observe communion, let's remember that we're commemorating uh, the events that happened the same night that Jesus preached this message in John 15. And so as he was encouraging his disciples to examine themselves that night, let's examine our own hearts. Let's examine our own selves and ensure that uh, we are where we should be with the Lord. If there's any sin that's between you and God that's keeping you from having full fellowship with God, would you confess that now to Him? Would you make plans to get that right with the person that maybe you've hurt? And would you deal with it uh, before you partake of that bread and before you partake of that juice? Let a man examine himself. As Jesus washed His disciples' feet that night, let's take a moment to wash our souls and make sure that we've been flushed clean as we partake of this uh, bread and this juice uh, here this afternoon. And let me just remind you that uh, in our church we observe close communion, meaning that if you've been saved and you've been baptized since your salvation and you have uh, have no unconfessed sin in your life, then you're more than welcome to partake with us. We invite you to join in and to be a part of this, and uh, we encourage you to do so. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. I'm going to ask Brother Tom Williams if you would pray and thank the Lord for his broken body. Amen. As they disperse the elements, remember that uh, just hold it there until everyone is served and we'll partake together.
The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. After the same manner also he took the cup. I'm going to ask Brother Said Gilworth if you would pray and thank the Lord for his shed blood. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. As the deacons will come around and get those cups from you, just want to thank you so much for joining in this important moment with us here today and we're going to uh, move on to our announcement time here for just a minute and uh, you want to take your bulletins out there and uh, we'll go over a few announcements out of the bulletin here and then we'll give our tithes and offerings to the Lord here today let me just remind you about um, men's winter basketball again tomorrow night 6 30 p.m. Uh, here at the church property and uh, it's open to any teen boys or men here in the community. And then our teen half lock-in is happening this Friday night, 6 o'clock till midnight. Um, parents, if they need a ride out here for some reason, let me know. Otherwise, bring them out here by 6, and we'll get them back home at midnight. I know that's kind of late to get out, so we'll come get or we'll uh, bring them home um, at uh, the midnight hour. So um, just let me know if there's a need there for that. Um, and teenagers, try to find one person that you can get to come with you uh, for that event. And then Sunday, March 11th, I mentioned this, but just be thinking about it. While we're going through this series on the vine and branches in the Last Supper event, we're actually going to have somebody come in and demonstrate that for us on March 11th. He's a, a, um, an Argentinian Jew.
uh, who uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Bill Katz is his name, and he's going to come and uh, demonstrate it for us and explain the different elements and how it, all of those elements show Jesus Christ. They all are a forward-looking picture of Jesus Christ. So the Jews, every time they sit down at a Passover Seder, they don't realize it, but they're talking about Jesus. They're demonstrating Jesus. They're seeing Jesus in the elements, and it's an awesome uh, reminder of who he is. So I just want to encourage you to be inviting people out for that day. It'll be an evangelistic time, um, and so I encourage you for that, but it'll also be a good time just for discipleship, just to remember who we are in Jesus as well. How about birthdays? Got any birthdays to celebrate today? Frankie, it's your birthday. When? She's one today. <laughs> When's her birthday? This Thursday? Well, happy birthday to you. This is the big five, isn't it? Four? Really? Wow, okay. Well, happy birthday. Hmm? Georgia wants it to be her birthday, too. <laughs> All right, who else? Any other birthdays? How about anniversaries? Any anniversaries? All right, well, you guys stop by the Resource Center and get something for Frankie and uh, enjoy that. All right, well, let's prepare to give our tithes and offerings here this morning. If I could have three gentlemen jump up and grab the offering plates here, uh, we will give our tithes and offerings to the Lord here this morning. And uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness uh, in 2017. I had a good year of giving. Uh, in 2017, considering we weren't working on any kind of capital campaigns or anything like that. It was just tithes and offerings. And um, you folks, I mean, God is really, God must have really blessed you in 2017 because you were a blessing back to him uh, through the offering plate. So thank you so much for that. Continue that diligence, and I know God will bless you for it. Let's pray together, and we'll ask God's blessings on these funds as they're given. Uh, Brother Mike, would you please pray for us, sir? Dear Lord, we're just uh, so thankful that we Thank you so much for that. Beautiful. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Remember, we've got lunch in the gym after this, and then we've got our 1 o'clock prayer meeting. We'll meet back in here at 1 1 p.m. for that. Let's pray together, and uh, we will be dismissed here today. Brother Brundage, would you please pray for us, sir?